talking to my wife, I have to get help from the Catholic priest. And he prepared them. He was clever. But God tells history in advance in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 with every single detail of what these powers would do. And you can check it out. And there's past fulfilled prophecy. And there's prophecy fulfilling in the present. And he says, this is what it's like. And he tells the story. And now I add prophecy to my scale of skepticism. And I put it on this side of the scale. And then I see, well, wow. Here is a, here is a reason why I'm here. Here is a story of origins. And here is a historic issue called the cross. Did that ever happen? Did any of these events ever happen? Is this what says in this book, this Bible that I read that made no sense whatsoever to me? Did, did, did this ever happen? And then you meet a funny little old man like that one over there with the gray hair, that funny one whose heart is always strangely warm. And you go <laughs> into the Middle East and you walk in the deserts and you go to the archaeological sites and you see every time, boom, the skeptic said it's not so and the Bible is vindicated. The skeptic said it's not so and the Bible is vindicated. And archaeology proves the, the statements in the Bible and Prophecy proves the statements in the Bible and history developed exactly like it said. Now you're not just arguing from the same paradigm as science brings. You have a whole host of paradigms that you add to your scale. And the scale can swing. And then comes the final nail in the coffin. The absolute personal experience that you then have with God and the walk that you have with God, and the realization of how He helps you, and how He intervenes in your life, and how He saves you. And the very first evangelistic meeting that I held all on my own, I was apprehensive. I changed my whole philosophy, and here I'm holding an international, it was in Canada, I'm out of my country. I have nobody backing me. I have no friends. I have someone who's working with me that I don't yet know. But I had a relationship. And I said yes. And I go onto that stage and I start telling my experiences and I start giving Bible studies on the little horn and antagonism develops. And people start shouting at me. I had double lectures. I'll tell you the story. Double lectures. People shouting at me in between lectures. They eventually wanted to beat me up. And then a little man, little man with Down syndrome. Every day in the lectures he used to come and he used to sit in the front. And that chair was always open. There were 1,260 seats in that theater Go and check it out. It was the Massey Theater in Vancouver. 1,260 seats. And one seat was always open. And he used to come and sit there. And then when these aggressive people came to attack me, this little Down syndrome guy came and he went through them. And he put his arm around me and he put his little head here. And he sang. La, 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 la. He was very down. He couldn't even speak. You cannot shout at someone, even less can you beat someone up who has a Down syndrome kid hanging on him. <laughs> it's a physical impossibility. <laughs> so the next day, I'm giving my lectures and I'm seeing, well, I'm in trouble here. And I'm thinking, where's the Down syndrome kid? <laughs> and I'm stretching my first lecture. And there he walks in. Oh, it was a side door like this. There were two side doors. He walks in there, comes and sits in his spot. His seat is open. He goes and sits down. I finish my lecture with a sigh. I start forward and the aggro guys come running and my Down syndrome guy comes and he hangs on me. Oh, I was so attached to him. <laughs> Thirteen lectures in a row. Thirteen days in a row. Every night, the Down syndrome kid. And then we moved the lectures because the halls are very expensive. After the intro, we moved the lectures to the church. Other side of Vancouver. Vancouver is a big city. Who's been to Vancouver? That's a big city. Other side of Vancouver. 
Down syndrome, kid no longer there. No antagonism anymore because those people had been left behind. The people who come to the church are really quite serious. So I'm lecturing there and I finished the whole series. And uh, Adventists are always very kind to me. I spoke from 8 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock that night. <laughs> Stone dead, tired. In the last lecture, the door opened and guess who walks into the church? The Down Syndrome kid. And he comes and sits in the front. And I'm thinking, this is weird. Because this Down Syndrome kid cannot possibly come here by himself. I'm on the other side of Vancouver. There's no adult with him. There are no parents with him. At the, at the Massey, I still thought, well, maybe he's part of the furniture. You know, maybe he belongs to the one who runs the place or whatever. Maybe his dad's sitting in the back there somewhere. I don't know. But here, forget it. How did he get there? And after the lecture, I'm packing up my slides and the Down syndrome kid sits there in the chair and the people go out into the foyer to take drinks. And I'm still packing in my slides. I'm all alone in the church. I have no verification. You just have to take my word for it. And I'm looking at him. And he's not doing anything. He's just sitting and going, ah, 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 ah. And I'm packing my slides. They were all in carousels in those days. There were no computers. This was a long time ago. And then he gets up. And it makes cold shiver run down me. He comes, and I'm standing on the stage. And he walks up onto the stage. And he comes to me, and he puts his arms around me, and puts his little head down there. And, and I'm looking at him, and I'm saying, Hi there. And I'm putting my slides into the thing. Continuing, and he just stands there and he holds me. He does nothing. So eventually, I'm thinking about all this, and I'm saying, this is weird. <laughs> so I turn around, and I take the little dance kid, and I push him away from me, and I take a step back, and I say to him, do me a favor. Tell me, are you a man, or are you an angel? And he looks at me and he does this. And he walked out. And nobody ever saw him again. And every single campaign that I have, when people run onto the stage, like in Slovenia, they ran onto the stage to take care of me on a permanent basis. And uh, the president there, and the, these people warned that they would beat up everyone in the hall, and they called the police. And the police came with 250 people, 250 policemen, and they surrounded the hall and all the doors, and the chief of police sat in the front. You see, God decided my audience wasn't big enough. I needed some policemen to hear the message as well. <laughs> but when those guys ran onto the stage, I didn't have that much fear. Not that much. It's weird. My little translator nearly had a heart attack. Said, don't, don't stress. Don't stress. Because I knew my Down syndrome kid was there. I couldn't see him anymore. I didn't need to see him anymore. But I know he's there. And he's not a Down syndrome kid. You watch him one day. He can kill 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one touch. Those that are with us are more than they that are with them. And I cannot prove that to you. And I cannot give you empirical evidence. That's my experience. And there are a thousand witnesses to corroborate that story. So now you add experience to your scale. And now we're way out of the realms of science. That's my answer. Thank you. First of all, I, I should I'm, I'm right here, by the way. The microphone didn't move very far. I should apologize because I, I raised my hand initially saying that I didn't know who you were. And then after a few minutes of you lecturing, I realized I've 
heard you speak before, so I apologize to mislead you to begin no with. No problem. <laughs> um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to put together sort of um, what, you know, what I can gather is, is your picture of, of God. And so what, am I accurate in thinking that you think of, of God as being like, um, you know, a, a, a personal God, like one that, one that is taking like a active, active interest. measures to like, to like change things on, on earth? Because I, I, the reason I ask is, is you said something about, you said the word intervention before. Yes. And I was curious to know like, is it, is it your intervene? belief that like, God intervened in your life and that's how things changed? Or, or are you open to the possibility that like God was always there and the truth was there and the design was there and the plan was there and then enough stuff went awry for you that you finally were like, you know, that you, that you made the choice and then once you were, you know, once you I had done that the thing. You Let know, me say, even as an evolutionist, even as an atheist, I have to admit there is no such thing as an atheist. It doesn't exist. Everybody has some philosophy. And maybe there was something out there, I don't know. But everything is naturalistic. He's totally divorced from everything that happens on the planet. He has no direct involvement. You can have an idea like that. But the cross negates that. The cross is a very personal encounter of a very personal God with very personal emotions and very personal concerns about every single one whom he associates with. And that's the God that I have got to know. This God is a personal God. He's a personal friend. I can pour out my heart to him as I would to a friend. I wouldn't like to go anywhere, least of all to La Sierra, to this hall without him. I cannot afford to be without him. And I have learned that no matter what the situation, whether it's a good time or whether it's a bad time, didn't Paul say that too? In good times, in bad times, in hunger, in poverty, in prosperity, no matter what happens, I know he's there. I know he takes care of us. I told the story, my wife over there. Recently ran out to go and tell my daughter not to go away, drive off without praying. And in her haste, she stumbled and fell and smashed her hip and smashed her, her thigh. And she had to have uh, total replacement of the hip, but there was nothing to screw it on. They had to put bone in there. They didn't have bone. She lay on the operation table for 12 hours waiting for replacement bone to come. They put it together. You ask yourself the question, Lord, look, why me? Why us? We do all these things. Wrong question. Why not us? Why not us? Why should it only happen to other people, right? But then, eventually you get to the point where you say... You know, it's hard because this thing doesn't grow on and the screws are loose and you, you're walking for a year and a half on crutches and you're thinking, does God really care about my personal situation? And my wife was doing shopping for something and we were in a mall and she was looking in the stores to see if there was a sale on here or a sale on there and we were in a hurry and then she came to this one store and she looked, is there a sale on? There was no sale on. And she had this distinct impression, not a voice, but an overwhelming impression, go inside. And she resisted it and said, why? There's no sale on. And then she got the overwhelming impression, go inside now. And she took a step forward. This was just a few weeks ago. And in her heart she had this turmoil. Does God still care about little me or is it only, you know, this husband's ministry that's important? I mean, people feel like that sometimes. As she took the step forward, 
the huge sign.